Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 359. Today, we're talking about the paradox of McDojos. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I love the martial arts. And that's why I do this show twice a week. That's why Whistlekick is a thing. That's why we do all of the other projects that we do here at Whistlekick. If you want to check out what we do, the best place to start is whistlekick.com. You can see everything that we do from there. Or if you just want to skip right to show notes and transcripts for this podcast, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while we do offer many of our products on Amazon, if you head on over to whistlekick.com, you can save 15% using the code PODCAST15. So what's a McDojo? Well, back on episode 119 with Sensei Robert Ingram, we talked about McDojos. And of course, you may not know him by that name, but you may know him from his social media brand, McDojo Life. And Sensei Ingram and I have had the opportunity to talk on a number of occasions, most of which were not part of an episode. But ever since we we put that show to bed, I've had this idea rattling around in the back of my head that that there's there's something deeper to the idea of a McDojo, something that we really need to be aware of that we don't really talk about. And that's why this episode is titled The Paradox of McDojos. First, I do want to apologize. Okay? Uh, I'm a little bit under the weather. You might hear it in my voice. I'm going to do my best to not cough. And of course, if I do cough, we're probably going to chop all that out. But it is affecting my thought process a little bit. And it is affecting my voice. I've got some phlegm going on. But I was ready to talk about this, and I've found over the years that when I'm ready to tackle a subject, it's best not to wait. So I'm not waiting. We're talking about it now. Here we go. So what's a McDojo? A McDojo is a general disparaging term for a poor martial arts school. And I think we can all agree on that as a broad sort of 800-foot definition. But when we get deeper, when we get down to the gritty, what actually makes a school a McDojo, we no longer agree. In fact, it's terribly subjective. And I would say that not only is that a good thing, but it's a necessary thing. Now, unfortunately, we in the martial arts have this culture of mutual skepticism. We are always critical I don't mean you as an individual, I don't mean your school as a particular school, but just in general, martial arts is critical of itself, of martial arts, of whether or not things are effective or whether or not they work. Now, to a certain degree, this is a good thing, because this is what keeps us accountable in a world, in the martial arts world, because we don't have official and I'm using air quotes here, standards. There's no single governing body. Now, there may be some of you out there who would want that. I don't want that. I'm, when it, when it comes to martial arts, especially, I'm very libertarian-minded. I believe that the best will rise up and the worst will fall off. And I think that that overall is true. Now, of course, when we talk about best versus worst, that is, again, very subjective. Because I could be looking for something at a particular martial arts school and find it and find it there in an incredibly effective way. You might be looking for something different and thus find that very same school completely ineffective. And that is the key, is that when we talk about martial arts and whether a school or a style or a martial artist are good or bad, whether or not they pass the test, the standard for a McDojo, We have to understand that it is incredibly subjective. Let's say that I want to lose weight or get in shape, however you want to term that. And I've heard that martial arts can be a good way to do that. And I go to a martial arts school that teaches very, very traditional, let's say, Ishinru karate. Ishinru, one of the styles that I grew up with, so I know it fairly well. And I know some of the principles. Well, Ishinru, the way it's traditionally taught, has 
shorter stances than other martial arts styles. Okay? Well, that may mean that I come out of a, of a long class training Ishinru karate and my legs aren't sore. And I don't feel that, that I'm getting the benefits that I'm looking for from that school. I could call that a McDojo because it doesn't meet my standard. But someone else, someone who maybe has hip or knee issues, may train at that very same school. And because those stances are shorter, they don't experience the pain that they did maybe when they were training in another style. I won't name off another style, but we'll say, say another school, another style that has deeper stances. Now that person's going to love that school. But I go off and I train somewhere else that, let's say, even switching schools, I go to the, the longer, deeper stance school, and I come out and I say, this is great. This is exactly what I wanted. So here we have two people with two different goals, and both of them find one of the schools to be great and the other to not be what they wanted. Does that make either of them a McDojo? Now, what tends to happen when we throw around this term McDojo is that people will define anything that is not what they feel to be up to standard as a McDojo. And that's not okay. It's not, it's not, it's not fair. <laughs> One of my least favorite statements, but in this case, it's incredibly true. Because I will go out on a limb to say every single school out there would fall under the category of McDojo to someone else. Now, originally, I believe that when the term McDojo was being thrown around, and I first heard it probably in the 90s, it was generally referring to a school that had reduced the standards required for passing rank and often charged more, um, more money for certain things. See, I grew up in an era where paying money for testing wasn't the norm as it is today, where um, commitments, uh, you, you know, signing, signing on for a certain contract, you know, I'm going to train at this school for six months or 12 months or, or whatever, that wasn't around, where we had very few options in terms of Equipment, people didn't tend to wear flamboyant uniform colors or any of that. It was a, a much more traditional world. But there were far fewer martial arts schools. And when we look at today, you can find schools that do things in, in probably any way you could imagine. There are schools who will take 10 or 12, maybe even 15 years for the typical person to earn a black belt. And most of us would say, well, that's silly. That's too long. And then there are schools that would promote people to black belt in one to two years. And most of us will say, that's too short. Because most of us are in the middle. So we tend to define what is appropriate by our own experiences. The people who are training in that school that awards a black belt after one to two years will say that, Five to 10 years is far too long, which is the average. And 15 years is unthinkable. And then the folks who are awarding black belts in 15 years will look at everyone else and say, your standards are too low. Now, who's right? No one is right. Because no one has the right to define what is and what is not good or appropriate in the martial arts. And here's why. The moment you say, this is, a good, this is good martial arts and this is not, if anyone disagrees with you, we have a conflict. Now, who has the right to be the, the ordained person to say that they are correct? when they define what is and what is not martial arts. 
Now, there are certainly some outlier sort of things where most of us will agree. And I see videos like this all the time on social media. But they ignore a very simple point. It is very unlikely that anyone is going to train in martial arts and not derive benefit from it. Let's take the example of the school that promotes to black belt in one to two years. Is their black belt equivalent to the black belt from another school? Probably not. Is your black belt that you earned in six years equivalent to the black belt earned in, say, 15 years? Probably not. Is that okay? Absolutely. Because the only reason that we really need to care is because of, one, a bit of marketing, and two, ego. If someone sees you'll earn a black belt in one to two years in some kind of you know, newspaper ad or, or marketing piece, and that's where they choose to go, that's fine. Because chances are they weren't going to do well at a school that typically awarded a black belt in 5, 10, 15 years. So I look at that and I say, I would rather have that person training and earning rank and deriving some benefit from this school rather than not training at all. See, for me, it comes down to one very simple thing, one very rudimentary idea that everyone who trains in martial arts benefits from it. It may be a small benefit. It may be a short-term benefit, but there is benefit. And if someone comes in and they start at what you might consider a substandard, a McDojo school, there's an opportunity for them to get better and to see that there are other ways, and they may want to go explore those. But if some of the people out there had their way in all of those schools that they defined, that even I would define as substandard, were shut down, how many people would not have the opportunity to train? How many of those people would not derive the benefit that they do from their training? How many of those people that end up training at other schools later would not have done so because they didn't have the opportunity early on, whether it was because of proximity or cost or just ignorance? Because let's face it, most people that do not train in martial arts do not understand that a black belt is not a standardized thing. Because we as martial artists have spent decades talking about that as the standard. How many schools out there are black belt schools? How many schools out there have black belt clubs? That's exactly what the language does. It creates that perspective of standardization. Now, sure, it's a standard in your school and your school only, or maybe in your system. But the rest of the world doesn't know that. However, if you were to ask people, hey, does this academic program that takes one to two years to complete, are you expecting that you would learn the same amount as this 10-year program over here? Most people would say no. But since we can't say that your definition and my definition are, are better than one another, there's only one thing we can do, and that's to focus on our own training. Or if you're a school owner, to focus on delivering the best curriculum, the best training, to be the best school that you can be. Because in every industry, the cream rises to the top. The best become known. See, in martial arts, when it comes to business, we tend to be pretty backwards in a lot of things. And here's an example I've used in many, many cases, probably even on this show. The number one fast food retailer in the world is McDonald's, unless Subway passed them, which may have happened. But where do we see every McDonald's? Next to a Burger King. Or rather, vice versa. We see Burger Kings next to, next to McDonald's. Because it creates an awareness that ultimately financially benefits both restaurants. If you were Burger King and you felt threatened by McDonald's, you would not open a restaurant right next door. You would open as far away as possible. 
But that's not what we do in martial arts. We look around and we cast doubt and we disparage other schools. And what does that do? It creates misunderstanding. And it causes people to not want to choose one over the other, so they choose nothing. When we look at the statistics on martial arts participation in the U.S., because these are the ones I have the numbers for, this is where we're based, our participation is roughly half of what we see across the world. If we could get out of our own way, if we could stop calling everything a McDojo, if we could stop saying you're doing that form wrong, if we could stop saying that would never work on the street, it would get better. And more people would have the opportunity to train and feel good about that training. So the next time you feel like putting a ton of energy into tearing down someone else, another school, posting what is essentially a hatred of someone participating in the thing that you love so much, realize that it doesn't benefit anyone or anything. And it makes the people who are aware of you and what you do less likely to train. Are there McDojos out there? Sure. But the definition is so subjective that I guarantee I and every other person on the planet, if we were to go and make lists of the schools that were McDojos, there would be some overlap and there would be some disagreement. And if everyone made a list like that, I will guarantee that the school you train at would be on someone's list. So think about that. I want to thank you for your time today. And I want to know what you think. Do you have a differing view? I'd love to hear it. And there's a few different ways. The best way is at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This is episode 359. And leave a comment on the post page. If you don't want to share publicly, you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And of course, you can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. I want to thank you for your time today. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 gets you 15% off whistlekick.com. That's everything. All the stuff. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 